Welcome to the stage, Dirk and Klaus, and they will be talking about open source in the city of Munich. The stage is yours, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the introduction, Thomas. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here and to talk to you uh, over our journey in Munich to Bots Public Code. Um, my name is Dirk Gernhardt. I'm managing the Competence Centers of Engineering, and um, in my business unit we have around 30 software developers. And my colleague, Klaus, please. Yes, good morning everyone from me. Um, my name is Klaus Müller, and I'm the lead of our new, brand new OSPO. And... Here. Yes, for the beginning, I want to give you some general information about our city and our IT so that you better understand our open source approach. And Munich has the largest local government in Germany because um, Berlin and Hamburg are city states and they have their municipal organization at the district level. And Munich has um, the whole city in, in one in one um, um, public administration, so we are the largest local government. We have 1.5 million citizens and we are still growing. Um, and we need uh, 43,000 employees to, to manage all the public stuff for the citizens. And we have uh, 1,200 employees in the IT department where, where we are work for also. Our annual budget is around 8 billion euro and we have half a billion euro for the IT department. The whole um, local government is organized in 15 departments and six so-called so service providers. One service provider is the IT service provider and the IT service provider where we are working for is part of the IT department. And we are a full full IT service provider, we have our own data center, and we are running uh, something about 2,500 application services and something about 2,000 application interfaces in between the services. So, your part. Yes, so um, I just wanted to tell you something about uh, what happened the last 25 years regarding open source software. Um, but I have to change a little bit and I tell you what happened the last 24 hours um, with open source software. Because um, when I came here, and I'm so glad to be here and talk to all people with your OSPO experience and all these uh, open source and free software people, I'm very glad, of course. And people come and look at my badge and they read, oh yes, city of Munich. And the next thing that they, what's about Linux? So, um, so I'm very glad to answer this question for all of you, so please don't ask me anymore. <laughs> um, you know, Linux, um, uh, I don't want to make jokes because it's a little bit sad, um, as, you uh, as it was mentioned in the news, uh, Linux is um, uh, shut down. Uh, we will um, shut down the last devices this summer, um, and of course it's a little bit sad, but we try to learn about um, this project. But the reason I tell this here is um, Munich is not only Linux, um, because of, cor uh, of course we are using a bunch of open source software. Um, so um, it, as anybody else in IT. So I don't think this is very remarkable, but um, I just want to get the focus away from this one project, didn't work out, uh, to the other big world of open source software. Um, we were using all the time, of course. <laughs> it's not possible doing this without. Uh, but to be honest, um, we were a little bit, bit passive the last 25 years. This changed um, four years ago. In 2020, we um, got into a new and more active level. Uh, first of all, there was a new city council um, and has taken clear position pro open source software. And in the same time, uh, we grew an internal community, um, mainly focused on in-house development, pub publishing, 
and all the things we do ourselves. This is um, where Dirk's department came in. Um, so this was a voluntary um, um, community. And now we founded last year our OSPO, um, last, last December. Um, of course, again, here it's very important to have backup from management and politics. So there was a city council resolution to build up this OSPO, and we finally started it. Um, what was very important, is very important, that we are a really integrated internal team. So we are not at the outside, at the front door. Um, we are developers. Dirk, as he mentioned, is um, the head of our internal development team. I was working in the Kubernetes area. So we are really inside our company, our, our, our organization, and we know the stuff and the all people. So this is uh, very crucial for an, for an OSWO, in our opinion. Um, yes. So what are the most important key success factors for using free software from our perspective? First of all, um, sometimes public money, public code is only focused on publishing your own software. And yes, of course, this is very cool because you uh, all are developers and you're starting pragmatically doing this. Yeah, I can change it and I have a cool solution. I wouldn't share it with the world. This is a, the, the, the soul of open source. But, and I think this too mentions this very good. Um, soft, free software is always a ladder. And the basis and the first step is always use. So you start with use open source software. Um, whenever this doesn't work, you try to improve it. And only then, just start your own open source software when you don't find anything else on GitHub or Google or, or wherever. So I just want to tell you something about um, our use and improve of open software. Um, let's start with use. So our paperwork and management is totally clear. As I mentioned, the city council says, do open source. But as you can imagine, reality in such a big, uh, big organization is mostly a long-term marathon and not a sprint. So um, what are we actually doing and what we're focusing in our open source, open source program office? Um, it's not the texting. It's mostly organizational changes. So what we're currently doing is, I call it force mainstreaming. Um, it's really just talking to people and say, yes, you can use open source. Yes, you should use open source. Um, this is very important because before we started, nobody was this, uh, took this advocacy for open source. Um, but we don't force people um, because it always will fail. And I don't like it to force people and it won't success. So we try to search for low hanging success. First of all, it's easier. Um, if you have a project with people who are all willing to do open source, it's much easier, it's much more fun. Um, and the reason why we do this also is to create positive role models. Um, you can say to an internal person who is only sees his um, horizon only in, uh, in, in his own organization, you can tell, yeah, open source works for Google and for every big company and so, they won't care. But when you can say, your neighbor department, your neighbor team, they work successfully with open source. Mostly you don't have to say it because they see it already and they follow this positive stream. So um, we are not um, running through the building and say, oh, there's some software, we have to change it to open source. We search for the people who are already willingly doing that. And there are many people, of course, most tech people, but sometimes there are normal product owners or something. They say, okay, it's very cool. This is open source. Let's do it. Let's try it. So it's very important to go for this low-hanging success. Um, of course, we try to move existing solutions to free software, um, but not as a hard lift and shift. Because when you just change so software from, from blue to red, okay, you have a free software, but it's complicated to explain this to people. So uh, we try to convince with features. Um, so you bring a little bit of gift, um, what works better with some free software. And um, again, this is easier to create this low-hanging success and to create positive role models. Um, and we try to go with the flow. Um, we don't point to some random software and say, okay, let's do this in, in free software. 
we search for big lifecycle um, management uh, when there already is change and people have to talk about the, the, uh, the software or the um, IT service. We just step in and say, okay, let's talk also about free software. And of course, we get the procurement process is a very hard German thingy with paperwork and so on. Um, but first of all, we do all the other things because uh, it's much easier. So a few actual changes we had by, uh, with use. Um, of course, we have databases, everybody has databases. We changed our standard database to Postgre. Um, this was a very easy step um, because all developers were, were on the boat. We did this for in-house development last year and for external tenders because it's, again, much paperwork um, this year. The next positive example is uh, Zamat. Um, it's an open source software. Um, to explain it, it's like a multiplayer email front end. And I took this example because we, we came with this feature. Um, because we give this to, to um, civil servants who are working with an email inbox, and it's very complicated that when you have an, an process and you just do email ping pong, it's mostly not really working and s stay somewhere. And um, with this summit, you just can coordinate this and work with citizens together um, with emails and we don't have to switch from an existing software, but we just added this feature and so um, we got no enemies at this. Uh, next example is Check Car. Um, it's a monitoring software. Actually, uh, the monitoring team didn't ask us. Um, they just changed the software and uh, voted for the Check Car. Um, and was, this was a positive example because they didn't ask me, but after once they came to me and said, hey, come on, this is open source. And I said, yes, this is good. This is uh, a little bit, this is, uh, this is kind of mainstream that people have to change their minds that open source is actually wanted um, by the whole organization. So the next step on the ladder is um, use, uh, is improve, sorry. Um, first of all, um, we um, value code contributions um, for our employees. This is, uh, we had to say this bef before, before it wasn't clear. People were uncertain if they were allowed to do uh, code contributions. Now they are allowed, very quick win. Uh, we will offer an open source sabbatical um, this year. This is an um, um, this is a six month period where you get paid by the city of Munich and um, can work on uh, open source software. And of course, we encourage people to buy support at open core software because money matters and uh, we will uh, have a positive impact on the open source um, ecosystem. When I'm talking about money, um, we also do sponsoring. Um, we have a an, an, an little budget by the city council and uh, start uh, sponsoring this year and want to select um, small projects where we can do a little bit sponsoring. So the next step um, is publishing, um, as this is literally Dirk's department. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to tell, tell you something about the key success factors of publishing open source software. So for me, the most important uh, success factor is uh, support of your top management. In our case, the top management is our city council. And yes, when we, we introduced um, GitLab and Git, I think it's 10 years ago or something like that, we, we, we often talked about uh, why shouldn't we publish our code. It's, there are no secrets in it. We, we transform law to code in the public administration and law is, is public. But we didn't do it until our city councillor uh, Judith Greif um, calls for open source and our city council uh, resolves or decided that every developed piece of code um, ourselves is made publicly available and placed under a permissive open source license. So um, for me is the crucial fact um, to pub publish our open source code is that our top management supports it. Okay, the next um, factor for me is a modern open source tech stack based on 
de facto standards. We, are, we develop around 20% of our applications and almost all interfaces uh, on this stack you see here. And we publish it on GitHub. And as I, d I don't want to bore you with technical details, here you see on the slide the, the different frameworks and components we use. And what are the reasons to do so is um, if you want to publish your code, your, your, your business applications and interfaces um, and make them open source, uh, of course you need a tech stack which is also open source. And another aspect is uh, if you use de facto standards, you have a worldwide large community where you can share your knowledge with. It's a really um, important aspect. And the third aspect is um, that your developers have to have fun to publish the, the code and and you need uh, to be confident and that you can better do if you knew if you uh, use a modern stack and instead of a, an old an old one and that is the uh, next uh, next success factor is um, a strong team that enjoys showcasing its code that's very important and when we um, starting uh, publishing our code two years ago, we had no no resistance and and our our team wasn't afraid of publishing their code on on GitHub. It works very good, and my conclusion was we have really a, a good, confident um, developers. They are um, very open-minded and they have really fun uh, to do so. And we ask our developers uh, in, in preparation for this presentation, wh wh what do they like on um, publishing their code? And they answered uh, the answers you can see on the, on the slide. And they really love the principle public money, public code. And they like it to show what, what they are doing, what the results uh, are. And they are really proud of it. And they like it to learn from each other, other from, a, from a worldwide community. And a nice quote here is, working together on FOSS projects is a win-win situation for everyone involved. And um, a big driver for us is also that we have um, more than 11,000 municipalities in, in Germany and they have all the same legal tasks. And we think there's a huge potential um, we can find, and not every municipality has to, to reinvent the wheel on and on, and that drives us also. Um, another recommendation I would say is um, transparency from the start of the project. When we start to publish our code, um, we have running projects and put them to the public, but that's not so easy because if you go to a project manager and say, okay, let us uh, put the project to GitHub, he says, oh no, not that that's, this is a risk, I have no time and no money. So we ever start um, convince the project to, to start pub, uh, publicly on, on, on GitHub. That is also an uh, important point because only in this case you, you find the, the advantages of, of open source, like you, you create trust because everybody can see. Um, you can exchange the knowledge, um, it stimulates innovation, it motivates our uh, developers to, to, to deliver or develop uh, a clean code in a high quality and, and uh, and the documentation it's it's better than in internal projects um, when we when we start um, with our tech stack I, I, I mentioned before um, and we, are, we have as internal repositories GitLab and when we we start with the 
standard stack, we try to convince the projects to, to make their internal uh, repositories public. And so the people learn more and more that it's very helpful to do so. We have a chat room for our developers and you can watch in the chat room and you see there comes a question and three minutes later there's an answer from somebody of the community and uh, you can see often that they um, put the links to the, the public repositories so that you can see, okay, I, I, I solved the problem, look at my repo. And this is also a uh, reason why we, it was so easy to go f from the public GitLab projects to the Git, GitHub uh, projects, I think. So last but not least, um, we have uh, some, some legal aspects of publishing force. Um, we, we may, uh, our legal department assesses our um, way to do with, with um, publishing uh, our code. And it, it takes nearly one year to, to work with them together. And here are some highlights of, of the assessment. And the first point is liability. Liability is the, the liability clauses in, in open source licenses are not relevant in, in, Ger in German law. But the point li liability is not so, it's, it's not relevant because it's only relevant in cases of cruel negligence or in cases of intent. So normally we don't have any problem with liability. Um, copyright is also not a problem for us because we don't expect that our developers work in their spare time. They are paid for it and they, uh, when they create software uh, during their working hours, um, we as employer have the right to, to publish it or to use it. And other aspects we will, um, that our employees are working for other projects we, we want to do with the uh, open source sabbatical was uh, close, has mentioned. So data privacy is um, in point for us. So um, um, for the developers, it's also not, not a problem. We, we allow them to publish under their clear name if they want, or they can uh, publish under a pseudonym and um, other di data privacy aspects uh, norm normally is, is not a problem. Our developers know what are sensitive data and how they uh, care for it. And the code especially is not, is not a problem because we are in public administration. And the last two, two points here are typical for, for us as municipality. First point is municipal law. It's a funny funny thing because it's not allowed for us to give assets away because the assets of a municipality belongs to the citizens and it's not allowed to give it away for free but our legal department finds out that publishing open source software doesn't impair the assets of the mu municipality so it's allowed to publish open source software good luck for us <laughs> and sometimes i think when i when i Read this, I think all the lawyers uh, understand uh, physics now. There's no law of conservation uh, for information, only for energy and materia. And so it works. And last point is competition law. Um, it's not allowed for a municipality or for public an, um, administration to intervene in, in the market. But this is also not problematic because um, we normally develop software ourselves only in the case when we cannot find the product um, on the market. And the software we, we publish is can use every market participant. We, we give, don't give advantages to, to some market participants. So that were our, our experiences with publishing open source and Thank you very much for your attention. We are always open for corporations and yeah, I hope everybody f finds something to take away and now we have time for questions and answers. Thank you.
Anybody has a question in the room? Yeah, thanks for the insights in what you're doing at the city of Munich. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, your developers have the option to publish code not under their clear name, but under a pseudonym. Um, I was wondering, how, how are you dealing with um, open source projects which require um, clear names um, uh, and require a contact they can, they can use to, to check for copyright issues and stuff like that? I think we don't have that case yes, uh, th um, today. <laughs> it's actually a new case for me because um, I just know that every project I know you can uh, run as Easter Bunny 123. Um, so currently I never got this uh, question. Um, and mostly most people who are in our GitHub uh, organization, they're working on our internal project. So we don't force them to use their uh, common name. And uh, for code contributions, I never met this requirement that anybody has to say you have to work under your passport name. So we're still waiting for this uh, <laughs> case. So and and maybe uh, for for the email address you uh, people use to contribute. I mean, in Git you need an email address. Is that then a generic City of Munich email address? Uh, or yes. How are they doing it? Yes, it's very good. We had this before. Uh, we are using a generic generic address, and we we allow people using a generic address. It's it's in, in our internal documentation, but we had this used before and. I'm actually not sure how m many people really work on a totally pseudonym. It could be that they're using their email address, and then, of course, in the in the commit, you can see the the, the clear name. Um, and I think we have about ten percent. You can't really um, uh, are really total pseudonym. Uh, most people use their their common net name though, because I use Mrs. Carl Emil. Um, I know very. Uh, active developer is, is uh, has his, his his nickname from the internet. So it's I think this pseudonym thing is more to allow people to work with their internet personality instead of the uh, common common um, passport identity. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, I have a question regarding um, each time that you are publishing open source project. Um, is the legal department has to approve it like per per project, or it's these principles that you have provided us? It's just a list that they gave at one time, and that's the that's the le only approval program. Yeah, yeah so we have we have a guideline, and and uh, uh, as manager, you have the rep responsibility that. Uh, your developers know the guideline, and but uh, the legal department don't don't have to check every project. This this would be the death for yeah. our open <laughs> project. <laughs> Devastating. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, we already ran out of time, but I'm sure the gentleman will be available at the back for questions. Thank you both. Thank you.